So uh, we finished up with insurance fraud. Now we're moving into the larceny offenses. So grand and pet, grand and petit larceny, um, depending. So again, phrases that have been around for a long time, referring to how much property is involved from the theft. Um, you'll see that there's a distinction. There's also an offense called larceny from the person. And that's when you actually steal from somebody physically, from the person in custody of another. So that they actually, uh, a robbery or a theft from uh, something that's on somebody's person. Whereas a grand and petit larceny you see are from the actual or constructive possession of another. So these are the fences that are more often used for shoplifting, stealing from stores, that sort of thing. It's where these larceny offenses come in. Um, and you'll see that when we look at the tiered proposal on the larcenies, they, under current law, use that $900 threshold that I talked about at the top of this page on the chart here. If it's a, a less than 900, it's a one-year misdemeanor, whereas if it's more than 900, uh, it's a 10-year uh, felony. And larceny from the person, on the other hand, is always a 10-year felony, uh, regardless of the amount involved, and obviously reflects something, a different different uh, perspective about stealing from somebody that's on their physical person as opposed to stealing from a store when there's probably less, uh, less opportunity for somebody to be harmed physically or uh, intimidated, that sort of thing. So uh, along the same lines, you'll see that the grand and petit larcenies, the, the thefts from, say, retail establishments, they follow the tiered proposal. So whether it's a $900 or above or below, that uh, um, distinguishing monetary value is again uh, discarded in favor of the tiered system in H87. So that uh, can range anywhere from six months to five years, or sorry, 30 days to five years. Uh, larceny from the person though, keeps the same penalty that's in the current statute. That's a 10 year felony. And there's a typo there that's a $5,000 fine, not 500 uh, in that column. And the, uh, the felony proposal for H87 keeps the same period of incarceration, 10 years, although again, increases the fine uh, from 5,000 to 50,000. So that's larceny, another type of uh, theft you might call it, or a similar Karen, conceptual- larceny from the person goes up that's 10 year, 50,000? Correct. Okay. Yep. And that's in the same line as the five, where the typo is 500. Yes, that 500 should be 5,000. Oh, I thought you said so 50,000. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let's double check as long as we have the statute right in front of us. But uh, just to be sure, um, let's look at the penalty for, for some reason, that's odd. Every time I uh, Not as odd as the 14 year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's true. <laughs> Ju judiciary <Yeah>. humor. <laughs> yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so the current penalty for grand larceny, you'll see that it struck through on, starts on line 20 here. Uh, uh, 10 years, 10 years incarceration and $5,000 fine. See that struck through in line one there, page 16. Yep. Uh, so yeah, that's the type of the current. The current fine is five thousand. The proposal in the H eighty seven keeps the period incarceration the same, ten years, but the fine does go up to fifty. Okay. Uh, larceny from the person, interestingly, um, does have only a five hundred dollar fine. Uh, let me see that. Maybe that wasn't a typo. Oh, it was not. Look at that. So okay. I was looking, right. So uh, it is only a five hundred dollar fine currently. So it go, goes up quite a bit. Right. Yep. Um, now, for, sorry, again, I'm, what's what's the definition from the person? Is it is it physically taking something from somebody that they have in in their hands potentially, or or on their person? Yep. Uh, you know, could be in your pocket, something like that. Um, like a, oh, okay, so okay, from the person, it has to be in, in your hands or on in your pocket or th that type of thing. 
Because like what's what's going through my mind with that? I mean, uh, I'm I'm gonna guess that um, with something like that, there's probably going to be some kind of assault charges also. Potentially, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. Certainly could depend depending on uh, um, you know the facts of the of the case, but it's sure. very possible. Yeah. So that brings us to embezzlement. You see, there's a number of different uh, types of embezzlement offenses. And I think everyone kind of has a sense of what embezzlement is. You're, uh, and then it generally applies to an employee, someone who has some sort of position of trust with an organization and, um, and uses that position of trust to uh, abscond with, with property or money. And these offenses are, you'll see that, uh, there are some specific, there's embezzlement generally, uh, which is a one year misdemeanor, uh, depending on whether it's $100. This one for uses a $100 threshold. If it's more than $100, it's a 10 year felony. And then there's also 10 year felonies if it happens to involve a bank officer or a trustee or a public official in their official capacity. You can see those as you kind of go down the left hand column there. So uh, those, if the embezzlement involves it, one of those, uh, one of the, a person who fits in one of those categories, uh, it doesn't matter if it's you know only if it's a smaller amount that for general embezzlement and qualify for the one year. It's always a ten year felony, but in the proposal it goes with the tiers. So again, it's particularly with respect to the the officials mentioned there. In some circumstances, the penalty would be less than some; it would be more. It's always going to be depending on. Um, how much money was involved. Again, uh, buying or receiving stolen property. I think that's an offense that pretty, pretty common, commonly, I don't mean commonly occurred, but commonly well understood by the plain language of what it is. You buy, receive, or possess stolen property. You know that it's stolen. There's a knowledge requirement. Um, that's, again, depends on the amount of property involved. In this case, it uses, the current law uses the $900 threshold. If it's uh, less than 900 or 900 or less, rather, it's a one year misdemeanor. But if it's more than it's a 10 year felony. But the proposal in H87 is to use the tiered system. So, again, if it's in that case, uh, it's less than $100, it would only be a 30 day maximum, which is substantially less than the one year that you would get under current law. Um, but if it were, um, you know, say in the neighborhood of, uh, well, actually, yeah, I say $1,000, uh, they, they still would get you less because the under the using the $900 threshold, even $1,000 would still get you a 10-year felony under current law, whereas under the proposal, it would be a two-year misdemeanor. So now we're moving on to uh, retail theft, and this is also... Um, one of the offenses that can sometimes be used for stealing from a store can uh, another one that can sometimes uh, I get it here. I'm sorry, that's the new one that we mentioned earlier, but uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Although actually might as well here as we'll use it because it's not actually in the chart because this is a, a brand new offense. Um, and I don't know to what extent Representative Lalonde, Representative Knott, you want to talk about this one now? I know we had mentioned it earlier. This is the one place in, in H87 where there's a new offense as opposed to just reorganizing the penalty system for existing offenses. And this is, again, is organized retail theft. So it's not just by one person uh, in one instance. Uh, rather, it's by one person uh, um, acting in, one, in concert with one or more persons on one or more occasions. That's line 15 within a period of 180 days. And uh, my understanding of this was that um, his, you know, sort of what, how this offense came to be proposed was that uh, people were conscious of the $900 threshold in retail theft generally. So they were people in, were rather than stealing more than $900, which would take you into the felony category, 
they might be shoplifting less than that uh, on multiple occasions, but each time trying to stay under the $900 threshold, so it would be a misdemeanor. And I think the intent of this is to say that under some circumstances, if they're acting in concert, that's the key language in line 15, that's all part of a common plan, then it can be charged uh, with this more significant offense. And and that was the part we were talking about the other day where it's organized and they know exactly what they're doing, correct? Yeah, I think that's the in concert language for sure. It's part of a part of a plan. It's not sort of a random happenstance. All this uh, all this jumping around here is just hard for me to I'm just having one of my senior moments, let's just say it's just we're we're um yeah. Anyway, all this. Never mind. You know what I'm saying. I hope. <laughs> I see. Well, I'm at. confused there. <laughs> well, we're moving quick through a lot of different offenses. It's under. Oh. Yeah. So, Tom, did you have a question? Because I had a question as well after. And then Bob. Died. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Thank you, um, Eric. That section 22 on line 15. So in concert with one or more persons. Uh, I think I understand that in concert with with one person just could be yourself. If if say you you were organized as far as going in and in uh, you know and stealing eight hundred ninety nine dollars worth of stuff, uh, you know day after day that was your plan. Is, is that right? Did you follow my question? I guess. Oh yeah, I definitely. That's a good okay. question. I definitely, I definitely followed it. I just. Okay. Um, think it's a very interesting question. It's a good question. I'm not entirely sure uh, whether it could be one person in a, or does it, or because it doesn't say one or more other persons. So uh, if the way it's written, it seems like it could be just one person doing it multiple times, but I'm not sure if that's what the intent was. That's a, that would be a good question for, well, for the advocates. Right. Well, I, and I'm the one that kind of pushed this issue, if I remember right back when we uh, put this in. Yeah. And, and I was thinking more uh, the definition of organized retail theft is, is uh, you know, more than one person. But certainly if I go in, if, if the limit's $900 and I go in day after day after day at eight ninety nine, I mean, you don't get any more organized retail theft than that. Yeah, um, it's an interesting question about uh, can you act in concert with yourself, I guess is the question, right? It's a good one. Maybe, maybe Martin's got something to say. <laughs> well, I, well, I know this, this specifically came from some concern from some law enforcement where it, it really was more of like an organized, you know, uh, where there were people who would go in and, and steal under the minimum or not a large amount and they would pass it off to this middle person who it really was, I want to say organized crime, but I mean, it was much more organized than a person going in on a day-to-day -day basis and just taking below $900 if people are right. doing that. I mean, we could get law, law enforcement to talk about this one, certainly. So, so right now, uh, uh, Martin or, or Eric, right now, I'm going to assume the way that the new bill is written or the new law is written that uh, say if somebody was at that, you know, 899 or under the threshold that they would just potentially be charged with a, a series of misdemeanors. That's right. Multiple counts, but each count would be only for the, yeah, if it, if it were under $900 each time, then it would only be for the, the smaller amount right and, and is there uh i, I guess a, if somebody has a, a number of misdemeanors for the for the same thing is there anything that where it uh, kind of accumulates into a bigger charge at some point uh i don't think so if unless you have you know as, we, as we've seen going through these statutes Sometimes the penalty increases for a second or subsequent offense. Uh, but oh, if, yeah. if they're, each one is a discrete offense, then I think they do have to be charged separately just based on the existing penalty for, for the single act. Right. 
okay. Yeah, I'm not looking for any big big changes and just explanation, I guess. So thank you. So, so Eric, uh, well, I'll let Bob ask because I wanted to go to a different section that we already passed, but uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, Eric, in looking at this organized retail theft, I, I <clears throat> we've taken testimony about uh, there's some entities that don't necessarily <clears throat> take a lot of uh, thought into adding another crime uh, to our statutes here. I, I personally like this, but in looking at this versus charging individuals individually, for this, I'm just wondering about the elements of the crime on this and, and the burden of proof for the state is just going to be so large in this particular aspect. What, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think, I think you make a good point that uh, uh, they're going to have to prove acting in concert with one or more persons on one or more occasion within that 180 day period. And that's certainly uh, a higher threshold for, for the elements of what you've got to prove than just your standard retail theft. But uh, you know, as you may, you may hear from law enforcement that, that when these situations happen, that they may have, the, you know, that only, only in, the, in those circumstances, they may, uh, they may well have the factual evidence to, to meet that burden. It seems like that at least was their thought. Um, yeah. But I think you're right. That's, uh, you know, that's much more elements to prove in that, in that situation than there is in just your standard retail theft. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if maybe uh, in the real world, they may just cut corners and just charge for retail theft versus this organized retail theft, depending on the penalties, which which may be uh, invoked on in this particular situation. Right. Or what kind of proof they have, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. And as I recall, Bob, that this was fairly, fairly narrow and in specific circumstances that law enforcement particularly in Burlington is really who brought the, you know, this to our attention. Uh, so it wasn't aimed at really broad behavior. They had some pretty specific situations where something like this would have applied. So that's good. I, I support it. I mean, it's just the burden of proof. That's all I'm concerned about. Yeah, no, that, that was also, uh, I think prosecutors have noted that it, not this year, but last year. So Eric, I actually wanted to back up and, and it's kind of interesting that I'm, it's been a while since we've, gone through uh, in this detail every every crime and, and it's kind of raising some some uh, questions that I, that I've just kind of not really well actually I've thought a little bit about before and I've actually even asked at the sentencing commission but I do want to back up to one particular uh, to a couple crimes and sure. I want to put a big question mark and this is probably not so much for you this is going to be a policy decision but I just want to flag it for folks before I forget it. And that's backing up to the embezzlement. And the embezzlement crime is really, it's it's little, uh, but particularly when we're talking about a servant of a bank and a receiver or trustee, the issue is much less the issue of the value as the breach of trust. And, and I'm really questioning right now and we'll ask ask uh, witnesses when we have people back in again, uh, I'm, I'm really questioning going to the tiered uh, sentence for, it's fine with the initial, you know, with the general embezzlement, I can kind of straighten that out in my head and that makes some sense because that already is looking at property value. But the incorporated bank and receiver or trustee, unless I'm missing something, that's I guess where my, I do have a question there. Uh, tell me if I'm not, if I am missing something, that's it's not relevant as far as the amount of money. It's just that there's been that breach of trust. Um, and I think depending on, you know, what I'm gonna probably end up proposing, uh, proposing as an amendment is, is to actually make that into a, a class uh, D felony, which is five years. It is different than 10 years. I think 10 years is, you know, is more, it doesn't make much sense. But, but in any event, I just wanted to flag that. Is that, am I reading that right as far as that it's not yeah. relative to, okay, it's not some. No, I think you, you got it exactly. Okay. So I just will flag that for the rest of the committee as well, that that's something I think we should revisit. Yeah, I'm, I'm noting it too. And also I did find out uh, Robin Joy did send me an email and said that actually a counterfeit, she didn't have any details for me, but a counterfeiting crime under that uh, offense has recently been charged. 
I don't know what recent, huh. is, but it's certainly in the last 10 years. So it'll be interesting to kind of find out a little more about that one. We can ask folks. That's all I have. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear the facts of that case though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so where we were moved on, we got through, the, oh, retail theft is where we were, that's right. We get through the $900 there, general. So interesting that uh, um, you have some specific <laughs> retail theft offenses you'll see involving UPC labels, which are, you know, the barcode labels uh, that you see on some products. And uh, um, they have a more uh, significant penalty than your standard retail theft for, for if you alter a UPC label, but you see that that's a two year misdemeanor. Well, as your general retail theft um, has, has uses that $900 threshold. And if it's 15 or more altered UPC labels, then it becomes a 10 year felony. And uh, the proposal from the uh, sentencing commission is to keep those penalties, at least in terms of incarceration, the same. So for, re, for the, your single UPC label, the two-year misdemeanor stays a two-year misdemeanor. Uh, the fine category goes up. Uh, same for 15 or more labels. The 10-year felony stays 10 years, it's, but the fine increases. Um, and uh, again, as with so many of these criminal offenses, when they when you see something specific like that, it's in, you know, I, I certainly wasn't here when it happened, but but whenever that statute got enacted, it was probably in response to some some either rash of crimes involving UPC labels or perhaps a criminal enterprise uh, had grown up around that. There probably historically it would be interesting, but that tends to be why, you know, same with the credit card skimmers or embezzlement related to particular particular uh, office office holders. Some of those will have come in response to to uh, you know societal development, it's things that are happening. Um, out there in public that are responded to legislatively. So this was, I thought this was an interesting one as well. And it, it sort of connected to the UPC labels. There's a specific uh, in the retail, retail theft chapter, again, probably in response to a particular rash of, of crimes or illegal conduct that possessing uh, tools or devices that shield merchandise from theft protection devices. Very specific. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know what those tools or devices would be. Um, so oh, you're you, killing me, Eric. I was going to ask you. <laughs> oh, you were? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, gonna, yeah, I needed a little explanation on that one. Yeah, As I don't know. More, the, uh, more than myself needs an explanation. <laughs> this, the statute, I don't think, I think just described it generally. Um, uh, but uh kind of pulling it up here it's after that but it didn't um well now we're into the theft of services i don't know how that got up there so fast but uh well, now i'm, I'm wondering if, if, if our resident sheriff has had any dealings with that in his multi-decade career <laughs> i'd be i'd be interested to know what, what those devices were And, and I'm, I, I think I want to, I'm going to flag that one as well as just to uh, get a little more information. Again, I'm happy that we're diving as in depth into this because uh, I think a couple of these things we overlooked or maybe we did get answers for last year, but I would ask again because having that device, it, it, we're, it sounds to me like what we're, what the issue is, is really having the possession of that device at all, much like the, like you say, the card, sk the, the card skimmer. Yeah. And I don't know how that really fits, frankly, with, with the value uh, as of the property, because somebody, you know, could have that device. It's an illegal device is what it presumably sounds like. We'll have to find out a little more information and it, who knows if it's been actually used yet, or maybe it has been used and nobody knows what exactly has been stolen because they were able to get around those uh, theft de uh, detection devices. Uh, any event, so I'm just gonna flag that and to ask some further questions of some folks. 
So uh, while we were you were chatting there, Representative Lund, I pulled up the underlying statute, and there is appears to be at least one example. Uh, it's similar. So in the and this is looks like it was dates from 1977. So that's when this was added, and it's uh, if you manufacture, sell, distribute, possess a laminated or coated bag intended to shield merchandise from detection by an electronic or magnetic theft detector. So that's that's one specific. And then it's a, and then on, on addition, any tool or device designed to allow or capable of allowing the deactivation or removal of any theft detection device. So, so uh, some device that allows the deactivation or removal of any merchandise. I don't know, maybe it would be like, you know, sometimes in a store they have those uh, yeah. those little attached clips. to the clothes, those things. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th you know, maybe this does make sense. Maybe whenever they uh, make an arrest that where they're dealing with this, it involves uh, the underlying property that's been stolen as well. But I think that's just a question probably for law enforcement or prosecutors really. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Those things well, are possible. With something like that, if you're going to have tools or devices, I mean, you certainly stepped up your game in the, uh, the retail theft world, I think. And, uh, True. And being able to, to, you know, to walk by the, the, the detectors, you know, who knows how much somebody could have gotten or, or plans on getting. So I, I can understand it uh, being a little, a little stiffer penalty. But th then I also have another question just generally for Eric. Are, are, do we have other places in statutes where uh, simple possession of tools that are usually used for burglaries and such carries a, a, a penalty? I think there is. Uh, I think there is too, yeah. Yeah, I think it's in the burglary statute that, in fact, it might even be called something like that, tools used for burglary or, some, or something of that nature. Okay, so it would be consistent with something like that, so. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. I'm glad there's an intent element of, uh, of this one though, because it, it reminded me, uh, anecdote that uh, I accidentally went home from Kohl's over the summer with, and I had a piece of clothing that still had that plastic thing on it. I didn't realize it. And it's impossible to get that off. So I had to bring it back to the store. And when I went in there, the person standing right there, it obviously, I was not the only person who had ever brought a piece. He knew exactly what to do. So I think that's, uh, I guess I was not inadvertently violating the statute because I did not intend to deprive a merchant of the lawful possession of it. You so that's going, a relief. You were going in the wrong direction, it sounds like, so. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. All right, so uh, that takes us into theft of services, which is uh, a different sort of theft as you can uh, get a sense of from the title. Uh, um, that one is an interesting one. I cut and pasted some language from that so you can see what that is really referring to. You see what services Includes there, this is uh, line 17, labor, professional service, transportation, public services not provided for otherwise, accommodation in hotels, restaurants, elsewhere, admission to exhibitions, amusements, or recreational facilities, use of vehicles, other movable property. So that's, those are services. So if you, if you purposely obtain services that you know are available only for compensation, and you obtain them by deception or threat or false token, again, that's a false documents, uh, by other means to avoid payment. So you try and avoid these services, obtain them falsely to avoid payment. That's what the crime is. Uh, the uh, retail, the theft of services is what that's known as. And that follows the same $900 uh, threshold that we've seen a lot in the property crime. So again, if the services that you've, uh, you've uh, illegally obtained are less than 900, uh, then it's a one-year misdemeanor. It's a 10-year felony if it's more than 900. And you'll see that the tiered proposal is what uh, H87 uh, recommends. So again, uh, some instances less, some instances more, depending on um, how much is involved. Although I see it, it wouldn't ever actually be more in terms of incarceration because it's never going to reach that 10-year 
10 year maximum, five years, the maximum uh, under the tiered system proposed in H87. We also have, uh, and you go into different types of property related to theft. We just talked about services. There's also theft of rented property, for example, in rent to own situations or when you're renting something. This is other than a car because you'll see there's a specific uh, statute related to uh, theft of a rented car we'll come to next, but uh, other any property other than a car, similar situation uh, follows the $900 threshold in current law, to the two year misdemeanor for um, below 900, five year felony for above. And the tiered proposal was what's recommended in H87. And in that case, actually, the maximum would, is the same because you see that the second offense, more than 900, maximum of five years is also the maximum that you're going to get uh, under the proposal because that's that class D felony for more than $100,000 maxes out at five years. This next statute is the one I just mentioned. Uh, you know, you're failing to return a rented or leased vehicle that's, again, with the intent to not just accidentally, has to be some intent there to um, deprive the owner of, of the vehicle. So and that has to- we, I'm sorry, can we go back? No, go ahead. So uh, the theft of rented property. Yep. And in, in, I'm looking at page 21, line two. Shouldn't that be class D misdemeanor? I mean, when you class, say, well, let me see class. No, I'm sorry. Class C, class D. no, no, no. I'm sorry. I take that back. I, 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 I've got it. Oh, okay. Move on. I, I was misreading it. All right. Sounds good. So, uh, um, so excuse me. So we are two minutes away from when we are supposed to adjourn. And I know that we also um, have Robin as a witness. Uh, trying to and I know at least some of us have, have meetings coming up. Um, yeah, you, we, we definitely need more time here with you, Eric, I would think to, to go through this and have questions. And, and I'm sorry, Robin, that we, uh, that we didn't get to you. Uh, so. Well, we got through a good chunk of it. I think we're through 70% of it or seven, set three quarters. So you know, I can come back in any time to finish it up. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And yeah, Eric, any idea how much longer, just in terms of scheduling purposes, how much longer? Oh, that's a good that? question. I would say, you know, half an hour, uh, okay. maybe 45 minutes to be safe. Um, mm -hmm. Better to have a few minutes extra than not enough, I guess. Right. 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 Okay. All right. Well, that's helpful. So we'll, uh, We'll get back to it uh, next week. But I'm just trying to stick to our time since since uh, these are long days and other folks, and they're not over for for most of us. So anyway, so any um, before we do adjourn, any any questions for Eric or or Martin? Um, anything we should? Anything anybody wants to bookmark or note for when we come back to it next week? Well, thanks for everybody for hanging in there. I know that was, that could be a little dry at times. So <laughs> I, I know it was long. So uh, I appreciate your, everybody's attention and good questions. So thank you. I thought, and Erica, awesome. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, thanks, no, it was great. great. It was great. Right. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to nickname you the professor, Eric, because. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And then, um, and then we'll get, Chris in also to help us understand how restitution works in the victim's compensation program. And we'll get, uh, we'll get Robin back and get through it. So, all right, thank you. I guess we can adjourn now. Uh, Eric, oh, hold on. it was, it was yes. so good. I had to do it twice, as you could see from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice compliment, coach. Thank you. <laughs>